Hi, we are going to have a look today at the January 2021 paper for Health and Social Care, RO21 for the Cambridge Nationals. This is a walkthrough designed to help the Year 10s and 11s preparing for their examination on the 10th of January 2022. Uh, if you are one of my Year 10s, uh, you have just completed this as your mock exam on Tuesday therefore this is very good for you to be able to go through the paper and if you're in year 11 you haven't seen this paper yet however this is good practice for you in preparation for January. So to start with as some of us have never done an external examination before let's have a look at the front cover and what it's actually telling us. So on your desk you should have information that tells you our centre number 37 104. Your candidate number, that will be a four digit number and you will be able to record that in the box. I'm just going to put X's for now as I don't have a candidate number. You need to put your first name and that needs to be your legal name. So if for example you are called something different on your birth certificate or we have that recorded differently on SIMS, you need to put that name on the front cover. By all means put the name that you go by in brackets but they must have the official first name on there. So I'm going to put my name. Okay that's my first name and my last name on the following line. Now I'm breaking all the rules here because I'm using a purple pen. So on the front it very clearly says that you must use black ink. The reason for it being black ink is because when the exam board receive these papers they will uh, scan them into the computer and then they're chopped down and the examiners will only see a section of your paper as they mark it. If it's in black ink, the contrast is much better and it's able to be read. If you do it in pencil, it doesn't seem to scan at all. You can barely read it. And if it's in blue ink, it's very difficult to read as well. You want to be making the examiner happy. You may be number 1000 of those questions that they've marked that this evening. You want to make sure that that word, those answers that you've put in that paper can be marked and the marks applied as easily as possible. OK, you'll notice that this paper is one hour long. Aim to have around about 10 minutes left at the end of the exam for you to go through that paper. Have a look at each of your questions. Has something else occurred to you that you need to add to them? Um, maybe something that you've done later in the paper has prompted you to remember something that maybe you couldn't remember at the start. You'll also notice that the paper is worth 60 marks and that there are 12 pages to this particular paper. It will tell you on the front how many pages there are. When you're checking through at the end, make sure two pages haven't got stuck together and that you haven't missed out some vital question that you could have answered that could be the difference in the marks that you need. Okay. It's worth having a quick read through the paper at the beginning of the exam. Pick out the easy questions that you can answer straight away and do those first. That's fine. You don't have to do them in any particular order. Then come back and look at the harder questions. Don't be afraid of those long answer questions. You know that they are quite simple and straightforward to get those full six or eight marks with two to three explained points. And we'll look at those carefully within this section. So, without further delay, let's have a look at questions. So, you'll notice here that we've got section A at the top. So there are two sections to this paper. And unlike some other subjects, you are expected to answer all the questions in the paper, not select certain ones. OK, this question starts with a case study. So it would be handy in your exam to have maybe a ruler that you can put underneath as you read uh, each line and to have a highlighter with you. Whilst it doesn't mention them on the front cover, you are allowed to use a highlighter. So we've got Sarah is a care assistant in a residential home for young adults with physical and learning disabilities. So we know here that we're talking young adults residential home, this is a health and social care sector, not early years. 
The people here have physical and learning disabilities. Every morning, Sarah selects clothes for Andrew, who has a brain injury. Sarah gives Andrew toast for breakfast and selects his meal at lunchtime every day. She does this to save time, as Andrew is slow to make decisions due to his brain injury, and Sarah has three other residents to care for. So we've been given a vocational context. We need to make sure that we are considering the people mentioned within the context when we write our answers. So for question 1a, we've got quite a nice command word. This is identify. Identify is just a list. So it says identify three of Andrew's rights that Sarah is not maintaining. Now we know that there are five rights and it's very tempting to write all five down. But we need to also make sure that they're linked to the scenario. There is nothing in there that mentions about anything that could be to do with confidentiality. So we should not be writing down confidentiality. It's also tempting to write more than three because you know that there's another one. But if you make an error and say you said equality and fair treatment when it should be equal and fair treatment, then they can apply the list rule and you will not get the third mark because you've got more than three choices given. So, three things here then. If Sarah is giving Andrew breakfast and selecting his meals for him, she is not giving him a choice. If Sarah is not talking to Andrew about what clothes he would like to wear or what food he would like to eat, she is not maintaining Andrew's right to consultation. And it also mentions that Sarah does this because she has three other residents to care for. Is she giving Andrew equal and fair treatment if she is doing this for him so that she can get on and deal with somebody else? And the answer there is no. So we can write down equal and fair treatment. Okay. Three marks, three points listed correctly. Therefore, we move on to the next question. So, Sarah is not applying the values of care. Now, we know that values of care are not rights. There are three values of care in the health and social care sector. Maintaining confidentiality, promoting equality and diversity, promoting individual rights and beliefs. So we need to be thinking about those when we answer this question. Now the command word here is explain. Explain one possible physical and one possible emotional effect on Andrew of the values of care not being applied. So the values of care, if applied, support an individual's rights being maintained. Okay. These are your pies. So I'm going to write that at the side. Pies. Not edible pies, no apple pies. These are physical, intellectual, emotional and social effects. In this case, on a young adult with a brain injury. So a physical effect on Andrew then could be that because she's selecting his meals for him, he may be being given food that he doesn't like. That could lead to malnutrition. So I'm going to write that in as my answer. Whenever we have an explain command word, we're looking for a how and a why. So the malnutrition is the effect, that's the how, and the why it could lead to malnutrition, that is our explanation. So we need to say, if Andrew stops eating, stops eating, due to not being allowed to choose his food, okay, 
then he may feel, I can't spell, choose, okay, his food, then he may develop uh, poor nutrition. He's not getting the vitamins and the minerals that he needs. So we've given them a why he could come to malnutrition. That will get us the two marks. For the second part, we're looking for an emotional effect. And people often get confused here with the social effects or even the intellectual things. Remember, if we're talking about emotional things, we're talking about feelings, how somebody may feel. So Andrew, due to his injury, may not always be able to verbalise how he's feeling. But that doesn't mean that he cannot still feel the same way as somebody without a brain injury. So Andrew may feel worthless. He may feel depressed, stressed. He may feel disempowered. He's got no control over his life. He's not being asked for his opinion. He's just being having things done to him. Life becomes pretty dull for Andrew. Um, if he's feeling worthless, it could be Sarah's taking no notice of him. She comes in, does what she needs to do and leaves. He could feel isolated. His self-esteem could fall. He could feel devalued, humiliated, embarrassed. And ultimately, he may lose his trust in Sarah as his carer because he doesn't feel that she pays him the attention that he needs. So we need to give them the effect. So I'm going to go with the feeling worthless part. OK, and then in pink, we've got to give them our explanation. So we're telling them the why. Why does he feel worthless? So Andrew is being ignored by Sarah. She takes no notice of him. So he ends up with low self-esteem. and may ultimately lose trust in Sarah. Ooh, trust in Sarah. Okay, again we've got there our reason, our how, and our why. That would get us the full two marks. Let's move on to the next page. So this is the first of our longer answer questions. This question is worth five marks. Okay. These questions are quite nice questions and you know we've done some of these in lessons to practice these. They do seem to come up quite a bit on the papers. So the question is describe. That's our command word. So describe ways. Notice there's a plural there. They don't want one. They want a number. So describe ways that Sarah's discriminatory behaviour towards Andrew could be challenged by the care home manager. So we've got three people mentioned in this and we need to make sure that they are referred to within the scenario. We know we're talking about the care home, so we need to mention that. But remember, when we went through these before, it's the same steps and processes. All we need to do is put in the right names to go with them. So there are three steps to challenging discriminatory behaviour. The first one is challenge at the time. At the time, OK. So we need to make sure that we've got these phrases in there. So I'm going to put the phrases into pink so that they stand out to you. So if you're going to challenge somebody at the time, if you feel that you can, then they're going to explain to Sarah how she is discriminating. Okay. They do this to raise awareness. Whose awareness? Sarah's. So we're going to raise her awareness. She may not even have thought about the fact that what she's doing is discriminating. And we may ask her to reflect on her actions of what she is doing. 
that may be the end of it. It may not. So we've said challenge at the time, explain to Sarah how she's discriminating to raise her awareness and ask Sarah to reflect on her actions towards Andrew. Okay, part one. The second stage, so we'll put this one into pink again, is challenge afterwards through procedures. So here we've got um, the care home manager is trying to deal with Sarah, so therefore we need somebody more senior than them. Now you may not necessarily know who is more senior than the care home manager, but you could say report it to a senior manager or a more senior manager and that would be enough to get the marks. So we're going to here report uh, the incident to a more senior manager. Okay, And what are they going to do this time? Well, they cannot at this point sack someone, fire them, get rid of them. And that seems to be the answer that students go with an awful lot of the time at this point. We have procedures. They have to be followed. So the manager may choose to implement disciplinary proceedings. They may give Sarah a warning. Um, let her know that her discriminatory behaviour is not to be tolerated. Give her some time to reflect on that. So we're going to report the incident to a more senior manager who may begin disciplinary procedures and issue a warning. Okay, step two, done. Step three in these is challenge through long-term proactive campaigning. Oh, that's a mouthful. So, challenge through long-term proactive campaigns. Okay, and what does that mean? Well, that's where we might choose to raise the awareness of all the staff um, by having uh, maybe a mentoring system where they share good practice or arranging staff meetings where they will discuss how we apply the values of care or even organising training to raise the awareness of staff um, and show how the values of care should be applied. So we can put that into here. So we've got organise training for all staff on application of the values of care. I'm going to be lazy here and write VOC. You don't want to watch me write out values of care. And awareness of discriminatory behaviour. Okay. So these long questions, they're given levels. So they're a levelled response. So to get level one, that's where you might identify things. You give a little bit of uh, information, maybe a list. If you just put challenge at the time, challenge afterwards through procedures, challenge through long-term proactive campaigning, you're probably going to be looking at level one because you haven't gone into the description side of it. You've just got that little bit of recall. So that would get you up to two marks. Um, level two in this case is worth three to four marks. This is where you've got a sound description but may not be fully developed. So you may have given one or two of the ways um, that we could challenge that and possibly related maybe one of them um, back to the scenario. Level three, the answer we've just written there is level three. You've got at least two ways. We've got all three. We have explicitly related the actions back to the situation. 
we've used correct terminology within there and we've given a detailed description of each of the stages. That's going to get us the full five marks. So, don't be afraid of the long questions and having a big blank piece of paper. If you need to have some blank paper to scribble on, you can raise your hand in the exam and ask for some. It does have to be collected in at the end with your exam, but you can strike it through once you've done so that it's not marked, it's just rough working out. But if you want to make a plan when you're answering these questions, that is allowed and that's perfectly fine. If you're somebody that likes to scribble on the edge of the paper, well at the bottom of this one there is actually a little bit of space, you could work on there. But again, if you don't want that to be marked, because that is not your answer, make sure you strike it through at the end. Okay, let's move on to page four. So, there's quite a big scenario here, and that can be a little bit off-putting. So this is where I'm saying, have that highlighter, let's pick out important information that could be relevant to our question. So we've got that progress primary school. So we know it's a primary school. So we're talking early years education here. Remember, this is children under the age of seven. So these are children in key stage one. Every individual is valued and helped to achieve their full potential. Lessons explore ways to show respect and develop understanding between pupils of different races faiths, cultures, backgrounds and ability. All staff are DBS checked and many are qualified first aiders. There is a team of staff trained in safeguarding. Their photos and names are displayed in the school reception area. All activities are risk assessed. Kitchen staff are fully qualified caterers and have a five-star rating in the National Food Hygiene Scheme. The school provides a choice of healthy, freshly made meals and a vegetarian option every day. Pupils with food allergies are asked to speak with one of the catering team before choosing their meal. Special days are marked throughout the year with themed meals celebrating, for example, Chinese New Year, Diwali and Christmas. So there's quite a lot of information in there. They've tried to tell you a little bit about how they're supporting diversity, how they're supporting safety, and through all of this, how they're supporting the values of care in early years. Now remember, there are nine values of care for early years. So generally, they do seem to give you um, the value of care that they're looking for, but I still think you need to learn those nine Unfortunately, there are many of them. And then you're thinking of examples that will fit with them. So in our first question here, 2A, the command word is state. So just like identify, it's just the list. State two different ways that Progress Primary School is applying, it's not a highlighter, the early years value of care, valuing diversity. So we know that diversity is looking at all the aspects of people's race, faith, culture, um, many, many things. And that links into the Equality Act, where we've got those nine protected characteristics. So two ways that we could support this. Looking at the information we've been given there, in the third line, we've got um, lessons exploring ways to show respect of different races, faiths, cultures, backgrounds and abilities. So we can write that down. This becomes almost a comprehension. We can take that information directly from the stem of the question in the scenario. So lessons, explore ways to show respect to all. One mark. Second question, second part, what else could we say within there? Well, the second paragraph is more about safety, so we're going to ignore that. But when we look at the very last two lines, special days are marked throughout the year with themed meals celebrating Chinese New Year, Diwali and Christmas. So they are celebrating different cultures. So celebrating 
different cultures, e.g. Chinese New Year, or any of them. You can pick one that you want to, to refer to. Now, there are other things in there that we could have picked. Um, we could pick the fact that they're aiming to develop understanding of the different races, faiths, cultures, backgrounds, abilities, that they're offering choices of meals, including vegetarian options, or that they've even brought a special provision for those with food allergies. That's showing diversity. It's showing that they're considering all of the individual needs of the children within that section. OK, let's have a look at question 2b. Now, again, this is another identify, so just short answers, but this is one of those two part questions. So it's identify one key aspect of the Children's Act and give an example. So give an example of how Progress Primary School implements that key aspect. So here we need to know some of the key features of the Children's Act. So the easiest one to remember, really, for the Children's Act is the Every Child Matters. And it's the five outcomes that we have for um, Every Child Matters. So if you remember, we had the acronym SHEEP. And hopefully we can remember uh, what those bits stood for. But the S was safe. The H was healthy. The E, enjoying and achieving. Uh, where have I got up to? Sheep. Um, the P is making a positive contribution. And I've forgotten what the other E is. That's helpful, isn't it? Uh, exploring ways to respect different cultures. So from the uh, Every Child Matters agenda, those five outcomes, we could give that as our key aspect of the Children's Act. So I'm going to put the ECM five outcomes. Okay. And within that, we're going to give an example of those. So that is staying safe, being healthy, enjoying and achieving. Explore different cultures Ooh, can't spell. and making a positive contribution. Okay, so remember here, sheep. Bar. Okay, each of the letters standing for one of the aspects of the Every Child Matters agenda for the Children's Act. I'm just going to highlight the letters. OK, that will help us. OK, just to summarise there for those that are wanting to have a little bit more about sheep and the Every Child Matters agenda, here is a summary sheet for you. So staying safe. Healthy, enjoying and achieving, achieving economic and social well-being and making a positive contribution. So, this question, I've already filled it in because my screen died. I really must remember to charge my iPad. So, the question asks us to discuss ways that a care setting such as Progress Primary School could apply the early years value of care keeping children safe and maintaining a healthy and safe environment. It's worth seven marks, so it can be quite a scary blank page uh, for us to look at. So I started breaking it down into a plan. So within this, to get the level three, which is worth six to seven marks, we need to have a detailed discussion of at least two ways that the primary school could apply the early years value of care, keeping children safe and maintaining a healthy and safe environment. Um, we need to clearly address each of those areas. So I decided to plan it out a little bit. And you can do the same. You can ask for an extra piece of paper in the exam room. And if you don't want to 
um, have that bit marked, remember how to strike it through. So here we've got different aspects to look at. We need to think about the ways that we could keep children safe, how we could maintain their healthy environment and how we could maintain a safe environment. And as this question is a discussion, we need to link in each of those things to how it protects the children within the environment. So in terms of keeping children safe, there's a couple of things that were already mentioned in the scenario that we were given for the question. So we've got DBS checks for staff, teaching children about danger, um, staff to pupil ratios. So thinking about when you go on a trip, it's about how many members of staff need to be with how many members of children. In secondary school, we have one to ten. In primary school, they have one to five in early years, one to eight in the older year groups. Um, obviously, if you're taking 10 children out, you're not just going to take one member of staff because if something was to happen, then you need somebody else to be able to keep an eye on the children at the same time. Remembering that any member of staff that's with you at any point in time on a trip is acting in loco parentis. That means they're acting in the place of your parents. Um, they mentioned that they had first aid trained staff, that they had safeguarding trained staff, and they mentioned about food allergy procedures that were in place. So all of those aspects fit to keeping children safe. Then we've got maintaining a healthy environment. So they've mentioned healthy meals are provided. Um, we could also fit in here from our LO4 studies about general cleanliness. This is about increasing their hygiene uh, standards. So by having the toys, the surfaces, um, the floors cleaned and using disinfectants on them and emptying the bins things like that just to, to cut down and we're going to have to say why so we're thinking about the spread of bacteria uh, we may as we've been through a lot of uh, this with covid we'll teach them how to wash their hands and remind them to wash their hands young children are not good at remembering and in the food prep it told us in the scenario that they had qualified staff who had a five-star hygiene rating in terms of safety, maintaining a safe environment, we will have risk assessments for activities, for outings, for equipment that they might play on. Um, pat tests will take place and a pat test tests anything electrical, wants to make sure that it is safe to be operated. In line with that, we might have to replace old or worn out equipment and we should have fire drills and things in place. As we've said, not just there just to annoy you and make your shoes get wet and muddy because we've been dragged out to the field in the middle of winter, as invariably it does. So that gives us a sort of an overview. There is far more there than you actually need within the question. But as they're looking for at least two examples, we're looking at plurals here, because it says discuss ways Okay, that's our plural. That's telling us that there needs to be more than one. That setting such a progress primary school could apply the early years value of care, keeping children safe and maintaining a safe environment, healthy and safe environment. So I've broken it into three paragraphs. This is so that I can cover all three. And in there, I've covered one is keeping children safe, one is healthy, and one is about safe environments. And we've discussed by saying how it protects the children. So for those who can't read my writing, as I normally write as I go, it says, trained staff will work with the children who are DBS checked. They will teach the children about the dangers and what actions may be unsafe. This will prevent accidents and potential injuries to children. To maintain a healthy environment, the toys, surfaces, floors and areas used most often should be regularly cleaned with disinfectant. This will maintain a good hygiene and prevent the spread of infection, which could make the children ill. Risk assessments should be carried out for any trips and the staff to pupil ratio considered. This reduces risk and the likelihood of children being injured or in accidents. That's going to get you level three, six to seven marks. You could be awarded five marks for one way if it was done very well, but don't rely on that. And remember, within these level assessed questions, you're always looking at two to three ways done well with good explanations rather than trying to give a list. If you give just lists um, like we've, we've got, this is a list. If we just gave a list like that, you're only going to get into level one. That's one to three marks. It's not a bad score, but you could get more just by writing some of those bits 
out into a paragraph as we have done here. OK, let's look at the next question. So we're on to question three. Read the following information about Parks Walk-In Medical Centre and answer the questions. So we've got another scenario, a little bit shorter than the last one. Let's highlight some key words as we go through. So Parks Walk-In Medical Centre provides treatment for minor injuries and illnesses, as well as providing health checks and advice on health and well-being. The patients using the medical centre are culturally diverse. Some do not speak English. The medical centre has employed a team of builders to carry out some alterations to the building and the car park to improve access for individuals with disabilities. So they're trying to comply with the Equality Act. So we've got a command word here, identify. We like those, they're just a list. Identify three ways, for three marks, that the staff at the medical centre could communicate effectively to provide health advice and information for the patients who do not speak English. So here, even though we've been given a scenario and we're going to try and link to that scenario, when you answer a question about effective communication, you've got the same sort of list of information that you could use. So because they don't speak English in this state, I'm going to start with using simple vocabulary. So use simple vocabulary. OK, avoid medical jargon. That links us back to the medical centre. Can't spell medical jargon. OK, they're unlikely to understand it if they don't actually understand English. So you're trying to help them where you can. We may need to um, use an appropriate tone of voice, slow down the pace. I think sometimes we speak very, very quickly. And if somebody's trying to interpret us and to understand us, that can be very, very difficult. So we could have, I'll put it in a different colour so it stands out, slow the pace of speech or alter the tone. We shouldn't be coming across with an aggressive tone because we happen to have to repeat something for somebody as they need it. So being patient and calm with somebody is another um, effective communication method. But for this one, because it's about people who don't speak English, I think it's important that we have into there about employing staff that will speak other languages. Hopefully the one that we need. Or alternatively, you could have an interpreter available. OK, three simple facts, three marks. OK, question 3b. Explain one security measure that could be used by staff at the medical centre reception to protect staff and service users while the alterations are being carried out by the team of builders and other workers. So we've got a number of people here that we have to consider. So, realistically here, anything that you've come across in LO4 about security measures could be used, but for three marks they want you to identify a security measure that is appropriate for the reception area of the medical centre. They want you to um, explain how that measure will protect service users and staff and link that to the medical centre. OK, so there's a number of things that you could do. It could be things like the checking of external entrances, having CCTV, um, having the reception desk manned at all times, limiting access to those who are not authorised, having ID badges, lanyards for the builders so you know who they are, um, staff having uniforms and being able to identify who's a staff member, who's not, because there's going to be a number of people coming and going as this is taking place. Um, or you could be thinking about restricting um, access. So having things like we have at school with the, the swipe cards where the staff can get to certain areas and you guys can't. Um, that's partly to protect you. It's restricting areas, so it's making it safer for service users and for the staff. So I'm going to go with that one. So I'm going to first tell them which security measure I'm talking about, and that's my first marking point. So I'm going to have security pads could be on doors. Okay, one mark. 
how does that protect service users and staff? So this means only authorised visitors, builders, or staff may access certain areas. Okay, how's that going to protect the service users? This will prevent intruders. getting into the centre so is safer for staff and service users and we've mentioned the centre one or two times but I'm just going to be clear on that at the medical centre third mark three marks Quite straightforward. Given them the reason or the example of the security measure, given them an explanation of how it protects a service user and staff, and linked it back to the medical centre. Okay, another one of the long answer questions. I know we're getting fed up of these now, or we might be overjoyed and shouting, woohoo! Unlikely, I know. <laughs> But this one's worth five marks. But again, it's a big, long page. So let's break it down. So here we're going to describe. So a description isn't going to be just a list of statements. If we're going to get this in here, we're going to have to give them key aspects and then examples of how those aspects operate. And in this case, it's in terms of the Equality Act. So it says, describe how key aspects of the Equality Act of 2010 can ensure that the medical centre supports the rights of individuals with disabilities to access their services. And some must include key aspects of the Equality Act and examples of how access could be improved. So these have to be about access requirements. OK, so for level three, this one's five marks for level three, three to four marks for level two, one to two marks for level one. Level three, we want that detailed description and we need at least two examples for improving access. We've then got to link it back to the Equality Act and we've got to make sure we've got a clear and logical structure. So this is where we're going to apply Peel. You may have come across that in English. Point, evidence, explain, link. So we've got to link it back to the Equality Act. So link to... Equality Act. OK, so how are we going to do that? Let's pick some key aspects. So the Equality Act works by having nine protected characteristics, of which disability is one. So let's point out that we know that first, because that's a nice introduction to it. So we're saying disability is one of nine key protected characteristics of the Equality Act. OK, so what does the Equality Act um, expect? Well, it gives a legal requirement for reasonable adaptations to be made to allow people in those nine key protected characteristics to access services. So in this case, disabilities. So we can say um, there is a legal requirement to make a reasonable adaptation to allow disabled service users to access a service such as, and we're talking about the medical centre again, the medical centre. So that's why they've got the builders in who are doing the work that they're doing. Okay, why do we do that? Well, we do that to prohibit discrimination. So this means that people are not discriminated against. So this prevents in 
individuals, I'm going to be lazy writing divs, being discriminated against. Okay, we've got a good grip there on key aspects of the Equality Act. So now we want to give them some examples of how that access could be improved. So we know that the builders were working uh, within the building, but also in the car park. So let's think, what could they be doing in the car park first? So the builders could add ramps or lifts to help wheelchair users access the building. Okay. They could also provide parking spaces nearer the buildings. They said they were working in the car park. So they could ensure ample, ooh, ample, ample parking is available for blue badge holders. Remember we said that not all disabilities are visible, so a blue badge holder does not necessarily need to be in a wheelchair. Now what could they do inside the building? Well, within there, um, they've got the things that the builders could do, so they could fit a lowered section of a reception desk so that wheelchair users can see over the desk and speak to the receptionist. So most doctors, surgeries, medical centres will have that. Um, it's a lot lower. Um, it might just be simply about having leaflets in different formats. So having things in braille, having things in large print, um, having a hearing loop available or a member of staff that can sign um, so that different disabilities can be um, there. Staff having equality training and knowing how to spot a disability, remember they're not all visible, um, and being able to deal with people who have those disabilities. That's all going to be relevant to this, but Again, you're picking one or two examples and explaining them well. So here we've got what is the Equality Act. We've got legal requirements to make reasonable adaptations to allow disabled service users to access a service such as the medical centre. This prevents individuals being discriminated against. The builders could add ramps or lifts to help wheelchair users to access the building. They could ensure ample parking is available for blue badge holders. You've covered, you've actually covered two to three things there. That's enough to get us the five marks. As I said, there are many other things that you can go on to say, but that's ample for this question. My battery is not healthy today. Let's see how far I can get before it shuts me off again. So, next page. We're on to section B. We've finished section A and we're up to page eight. So question 4a, give a different example of appropriate protective clothing that could be worn by each of the following care workers. So for each example, give a different explanation of how it can reduce the spread of infection. So we're looking at an explanation, it's an explain, so it's that how and the why. Okay, so we've got... Um, something example of protective clothing for a care assistant serving food. Okay, a lot of people when we did this one in class were thinking about the hygiene hat. So let's have that hygiene hat. How does it reduce the spread of infection? So a hygiene hat ensures that hair doesn't fall into the food, and the hair would carry bacteria, so therefore it prevents the transfer of bacteria. I've spelt hygiene wrong there. Just a moment. There we go. Shouldn't write and talk at the same time. So, prevents foot hair, which carries bacteria, falling into food and contaminating. Three marks. Okay, a surgeon carrying out an operation. What might we see there? Now this is where it's important. If we're talking about gloves, that we're clear that these are disposable gloves, 
spinal gloves, surgical gloves, rather than them thinking that you're wearing your mum's marigolds that she uses when she's doing the washing up. So we could have disposable, in this case, surgical gloves. Okay, how does that prevent the spread of infection? Well, that provides a barrier. So this is a barrier method to prevent transfer of bacteria to patients from the surgeon. Remember that we said there are 36,000 bacteria living on every square centimetre of your skin. That becomes an issue if there is an open wound. So if the surgeon was wearing no gloves and just carrying it out with his bare hands, even though he'd washed them, there is a chance that bacteria could get into a wound and therefore contaminate and cause an infection for the patient. OK, a nursery worker changing a nappy. Example of protective clothing. Well, again, we might want to think about gloves there, but let's have a different one so we've got a range. So I'm going to go here with disposable aprons. And we'd rather they were disposable than washable ones because if you've got faeces on them or anything else that you've got on them, bodily fluids, we don't want that passing over. So again, it is um, a barrier method, method to prevent transfer of bacteria. And in this case, it could be going the other way as well. So it's from the faeces getting onto the workers' clothes. Um, at the nursery and then them taking that and going to deal with another child and passing it on there. So prevents cross-contamination from workers' clothes. Okay, three marks. Moving on. Number four then, give three reasons three reasons why it is important to apply the values of care. So we're going all the way back to LO2. Why do we do that? And there are many reasons, but let's just give them three. Remember that list rule. So it could be to ensure all service users receive appropriate care. It could be to make sure that the needs of the service users are met. And it could also be about preventing discrimination. Now again, as I said, there are many things that you could put here. Um, so it's Ensuring standardisation of care, so service users get that appropriate care, the attention, the treatment that they need. They feel that they're treated fairly. The staff are working to the same high standards. The service users are going to feel that they are valued, they are respected. They're going to feel empowered, confident, trust in the staff. Um, it improves the quality of care that they, they get. Okay. Um, they get clear guidelines that will inform them and improve their practice, and that's for the staff. Um, they know about good practice, they know how to make sure that they're giving good practice and that they're not discriminating against somebody. They are maintaining or improving the quality of life for that service user. It increases their dignity, their self-worth, their self-esteem. Remember we talked about that care certificate and how and that could um, link back into it as well. Okay. Question C, another state one, so just a list. Three ways that practitioners can maintain confidentiality while having meetings to discuss service users. So we've come across confidentiality a few times. It comes up in values of care, but it also comes up as one of our rights. So the biggest thing we have here is about sharing information only on a need-to-know basis. So sharing info on need to know basis. That's not everybody needs to know 
everything, only those who are directly involved in the support and care of the service user. They're having these meetings to discuss them, so they should be in a private room. So meetings held in a private room. Okay, and that could be a case of the doors of the room need to be closed or a meeting in progress sign, do not enter on the door, keep people out. Um, not having discussions in private in public places, corridors, so that they're overheard. You know, it's it's all that side of it, um, and making sure that they're safe from that. Not leaving files and notes behind in the meeting room, so anybody who comes in after can can read them as well. Um, and that happens more often than it should, I think. Um, so I'm going to put on here, not leaving notes or files in the room to prevent unauthorised access. Okay, right, here we go again. Give an example of up-to-date information a care setting could provide for service users. State, so it's just like identify again, that's our command word, how the information will support an individual's rights. So this one's split down into two parts. So it could be as simple as the time that service is open, and that's quite a popular one to use, so we're going to use that. Time services open. Okay, how does that support the individual's rights? Well, they know when they can come, they know when they can access the services at a convenient time to them, they're not going to waste money transporting themselves there to find out that it's closed and then get angry and then find that they, they sort of lose confidence in the, in the service. So we can say individuals know when to access the service and can choose when to attend. OK, two marks. As I said, there are other things there. We could have the type of care that they provide, um, the location, knowing the address and where it is so they can get there, get a taxi there, um, contact details so that they can get in touch if they need to, um, things like complaints procedures as well we could fit in there. So knowing who to complain to and how to do that. OK. And then we've got question five. Let's have a look. Another big question. So this one's five marks. This one says outline. So here we're going to need to get some key facts in. So we're outlining how the Data Protection Act of 2018 sets out the standard of practice and conduct that health, social and early years care workers should meet. So to get level three in this, which is the five marks, we've got to have a detailed outline of the Data Protection Act. And alongside that, two examples of care worker practice linked back to the Data Protection Act. So we're peeling again. OK, so I've recommended that you learn two to three aspects of the Data Protection Act. Once you know those, you'll be able to apply those to any of the questions. Don't try and learn the whole Data Protection Act. You're not going to be able to remember it. But if you can pick two to three bits that you can remember then use those so i'm going to pick three here that i can use so i'm going to have um, data should be processed fairly and lawfully so data should be processed fairly and lawfully okay that's the key terminology from the data protection act and now we need to say what that actually means so this means we do not collect and use service users' personal information without their permission. And when we do use it, we only use it on a need-to-know basis. OK, so data should be processed fairly and lawfully. So only collected with permission from the service user. And only used 
on a need to know basis. If you can hear strange noises, that is my tiny dog has decided to come in the room and trot around on the laminate flooring just so that everybody can hear him. So that's our first one point done. Okay, now once we've got that data, we can only use it for the purpose for which it was intended. You cannot collect someone's data and then sell it onto Vodafone so that they can start ringing you up and trying to flog your mobile phone. So I'm going to switch colours just so we've got it. Used, or data used, only for the purpose for which it was intended. Okay, so let's relate this back to our settings. So we should say care workers will hold information and can only use it for the purpose of that information. So that might be they've got somebody's date of birth, address, phone number. They should be using that so that they can ring them, turn up to visit them or collect their prescriptions because they'll need the date of birth for that. But they shouldn't be then saying to people, oh, I've got a lady whose birthday's next week and it's this, can you do such and such for her? Because that would be a breach of data protection. So data used only for the purpose for which it was intended. Let's relate that to the scenario. Care workers may have details such as date of birth, address or telephone number and they cannot use this for other reasons than the original reason for collection. Okay, we've got two aspects there. Let's get a third in just to, as we like to. So I like the one kept for no longer than necessary. So we have the statute of limitations um, that they can only keep data for six years plus current unless it's something linked to um, crime and things, in which case there are different uh, reasons around that. So we've got data should not be kept for longer than necessary. So if a service user has been discharged from a service, then they need to make sure that they delete or destroy any information about them because it's no longer needed. And that may mean that they need to securely shred it or um, deal with it that way. So data should not be left for longer than necessary. So once a service user has been discharged, All data is securely destroyed or stored, depending on the time that we're doing it. But again, if they don't come back into service, we're not going to um, use that information against them. Done. Five marks. Okay, last question on the paper. So... Quite a nice one to end on and this is why I said flip through the paper you might find that this is a nice question to start on you can always work backwards through the paper so it says match the correct answer so it's a matching up exercise numbered one to five in the list below for each action given in the table each answer may be used once more than once or not at all so we've got here safety legislation number one safety measures number two Working with other professionals, number three. Safety procedures, number four. And discrimination, number five. So we've been given four actions. We've got to give them a number. So we've got using wet floor signs. Well, that is actually a safety measure. That's number two. We put those down to comply with the Health and Safety at Work Act to make sure that people know that there's water on the floor and they don't um, slip on it. Displaying the health and safety law poster, well, that actually comes under the safety legislation. There is a legal requirement to have that poster on display within a workplace. Uh, carrying out a risk assessment, that's a safety procedure. So that's a procedure that will take place 
to make a risk assessment, write it up and have that information there should it be needed. And the last one, an employer providing protective clothing. So that's giving them PPE. And we know that under the Health and Safety at Work Act of 1974, employers are obliged to find, provide personal protective equipment to any member of staff free of charge. Therefore, that comes under number one, safety legislation. Four marks and congratulations, we've reached the end of the paper. Now you'll notice this is only on page 11. On the back page of this exam, there was additional answer space if you wanted to use it for planning out or making any notes, or if you didn't have enough space. So if you found that your long answer questions and you've got quite big writing, took up more space than you needed, there is a little bit of extra space there. If you're going to use it, make sure that you put the question number. So if, for example, this was question 5A, which was one of our long answer questions, I need to make sure that it says 5A there. And then I continue with my writing. What I would also recommend you do is at the bottom of your page, if you're going on to extra paper, put continued on extra sheet. Okay, and then they will tag it together. So I'm going to continue. Okay, if you still haven't got enough paper, you can ask for more paper to be given in the exam. Please make sure that you write on the top of any extra sheets. I'm going to write it under here. Any extra sheets. And let's add a page in at the back so that we can show what it would look like. We'll have rule page. You need to put your name, your candidate number, and that will be on the desk waiting for you. The centre number. And then the question. And then continue to write. I hope that you found that useful. I am going to make this available to you through Classroom. I realise it's quite long, it is an hour paper, and we have expanded on that, but hopefully it will help you in the final exam. If you've got any questions, please do send me an email, but good luck. Bye.